is Jack Malwicki, and I'm with the Congregations of St. Joseph, and I will be moderating today and giving a few opening remarks. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Thank you for participating in this incredibly crucial conversation. Um, we have attendees today from all over the world, from a variety of industries, from civil society to education, uh, to activism, to local government. So I would just like to say thank you right off the bat. I would also like to thank our wonderful panelists today. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise with us. Um, I would like to make a quick announcement. We have added an additional panelist since the flyer and concept note were distributed. Uh, Grace Mooster is the president of the Catholic Relief Service Masters at St. John's University. So we would like to thank her for her contribution and participation today. Um, and we would also like to thank the NGO Committee for financing, on Financing for Development, excuse me, for co-sponsoring this webinar. The committee does fantastic work and we are incredibly privileged to have their support in this endeavor. I would like to begin with a quick story kind of exemplifying how well development programs can go when youth voices are taken into consideration and how how negative the impacts can be when they are not, what the consequences can be when youth voices on the ground are not considered in financing for development projects in their own communities. The Sierra Leone Psychiatric Teaching Hospital is the only functioning psychiatric hospital in Sierra Leone. Um, this hospital is hundreds of years old and prior to 2018, it was in relative disrepair. The facility had no electricity, no running water, no plumbing. It had a lack of medication to treat patients. And it also had a lack of qualified personnel to staff the facility. Now, this, this doesn't speak to a lack of healthcare professionals and psychiatric professionals being developed and produced in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone, Leone produces fantastic healthcare professionals. However, the brain drain is an incredibly relevant problem in Sierra Leone. The Human Fight the Brain Drain Index ranked Sierra Leone as 10th in 2017 as having the highest um, economic, excuse me, impact from human displacement for economic or political reasons. So while fantastic healthcare and psychiatric professionals were being born and growing up in Sierra Leone, many of them were leaving to practice their trade. Um, prior to 2018, a well-meaning charity had heard about the issues of the Sierra Leone Psychiatric Teaching Hospital and decided that they wanted to fund a development project for this hospital. They wanted to do something to ensure that the hospital had functioning electricity. So they raised the money and developed a project where they would donate two large generators to the hospital and fund their installation. However, this charity, while well-meaning, did all of this without consulting with staff on the ground, without consulting with many of the people who served in this hospital, many of whom were youth. And in doing this, um, once the generators were installed up and running, they were found to be incompatible with the hospital's electrical grid. They did not function. And they sat there on the hospital grounds for years. Every single day that these generators, each of worth thousands of dollars, sat unused in the hospital was a day that the patients and the staff at this psychiatric teaching facility, this hospital, went without electricity. Every single day that these generators sat there is a day when money, time, and resources went wasted. In 2019, Partners in Health, in collaboration with the local and national governments, developed a program to kind of renovate the hospital communicating with those on the ground. They were able to develop a system of electricity, running water, plumbing. However, this does not solve the issue of the brain drain. This does not solve the issue of a lack of staff to run the hospital. So what Partners in Health did was they communicated with youth in the country and on the ground. And they found that when professionals are able to pursue higher education in their home country, 
And when they are able to practice in facilities that are not lacking in resources, they are more likely to stay. So in knowing this, a program was developed and funded to invest in the medical professionals of the future in Sierra Leone, to invest in Sierra Leone's youth. Having communicated with youth and knowing what needs were in the Sierra Leone Psychiatric Teaching Hospital, a program was developed to educate young people so that they were able to continue giving back to their community, investing in their community in a sustainable way. With this example in mind, I would like to move into the main portion of our program today and introduce our panelists. I will be calling each panelist to give a short introduction. Please state your name, what your background is in, and a bit about how your work applies to youth and financing for development. Um, Cynthia, would you like to start? Sure. I, I am Cynthia Matthew. I represent the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary Loreto. And I'm also a member of the NGO Committee on Financing for Development. I was at uh, New York and because of the COVID-19 held up in uh, Bihar, Patna. Thank you. Should I continue or? If you'd like to give a brief statement about how your work applies to youth, you already spoke on how it applies to finance. So your choice. So uh, I, I begin my conversation just asking, if I ask you a question, can you live without money? I'm sure the answer will be no. Of course, we all need money. So also a country, finance pays a key role in the, in the sustainable development of a nation. I know that many of you who are listening to me uh, are expert in the area of financing for development. I'm not going into the various aspects of financing. Um, I'm going to speak about the importance of financing for development from my own experience of working with the people living in extreme poverty, not having access to education, good health care, proper sanitation and water, public transport, no social protection. And even if there are social protection policies, they're not in place due to corruption and lack of uh, good governance. I remember our women folk in the villages who had no land to cultivate, no work as the machines have taken over human labor. Earlier women would go for wheat or paddy harvesting and earn something for their living. But now the harvester machine has taken over that work. So the women do not get any work during the harvesting time. It is the same uh, with the planting time. So we uh, managed to persuade them to uh, save some amount of money by saving a handful of rice every day. And at the end of the month, they are able to have little amount of money and they could bring that money to the common group and save as the common fund. We formed self help groups and these groups into federations and the federations into cooperatives. This has given a big boost to the economic, social and political empowerment of women in rural areas. The women started income generating activities and earned money. More importantly, the income generating activities were carried out with the help of their sons and daughters who are youth. You know that youth are very creative and innovative. They were able to educate their children, able to get medical care, able to pay back the debt and so on. So it shows the importance of finance for a holistic development. We see finance as a key lever to influence sustainable outcomes. One may ask, why should these women, the youth, the people in the villages live in extreme poverty? Yes, the government needs to put the finance systems and policies in place for the development of all its citizens. Yes, finance play a key role in sustainable development of a nation. As we all know, finance is important in eradicating poverty and hunger, improving health and education, providing access to affordable energy for the development of infrastructure, promoting gender equality, etc. It is important that we all, especially the youth, be part of the follow-up process of 
Addis Ababa Action Agenda, which is a global framework that seeks to align financing flows and policies with economic, social, and environmental priorities. It contains national and international commitments that is make our leaders accountable to what they have agreed to. Financing is very crucial now as the whole world is affected by the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Even Secretary General in his remarks to the ECOSOC Forum on Financing Sustainable Development in the context of COVID-19 said, this is not only a health crisis, but a human crisis, a job crisis, a humanitarian crisis, and a development crisis. He calls on the world leaders and the financial institutions to work together in solidarity and cooperation. The role of finance has become more crucial at this time of pandemic. I think I, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, thank you so much for your insight. Uh, I would like to now move on to uh, Sister Santrina, if you could introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Jacqueline. My name is Sister Mary Santrina from Loreto, Eastern Africa province. We are formerly known as the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And currently, I am the communications person, as well as assisting in the development office of the province. And I will be sharing on the question of why the youth should be engaged in development, particularly financing for development. So from my perspective, we work with young people, especially in schools. We also work with young people in outside projects, plus their parents together. But uh, if I may ask, what is the right person? What is the right age at which a person should be involved or engaged in financing for development? And I can answer by saying that we can't wait for that right age. This is the right age. As soon as someone has a mind of thinking and uh, sharing an idea, youths are seated on one million ideas. So any time is the right time to tap on those ideas. It is never too early to start. This is the right time to start. The whole world is faced with the pandemic of COVID-19. And the youth today are the ones who are going to suffer the aftermath because it took the whole world off guard. Nobody knew it was coming. Nobody could guess the intensity of the virus. But now jobs are closing down. Economic sectors are not working. Social sectors are also affected. Every area is affected. The youth are suffering hunger, disease, insecurity, and all sorts of things. So it is very important that someone helps these young people grow into empowerment so that they can get the capacity to know how to uplift the suffering world out of this aftermath of COVID-19. We all know that uh, the youth occupy a big population in the world. At least by 2019, August, on the International Youth Day, it was recorded that the youth occupy a percentage of 16% on the global population. And this population of youth is growing steadily. So how will it be if these young people are not empowered? They hold the future of tomorrow. So it is important that the youth are given the foundational knowledge, especially in financing for development, such that their participation can begin to grow. And with time, they will be the owners of different projects, they'll be managing them. The youth need to be trained on how to make money, how to multiply money, and how to spend money in a wise way. How will they learn this if they are not engaged? Engagement is important right now for everybody. I can stop there for now, then we can carry on the discussion later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. That was greatly appreciated, uh, incredibly timely. Um, moving on from why it is necessary to have youth involved in financing for development and projects in their own community, I would like to ask Grace to introduce herself and speak a bit on the challenges in involving youth as well. Hi, uh, so I'm Grace Musser. Uh, I am a rising junior at St. John's. Grace, we're having a bit of trouble hearing you. No. Oh. Oh, gosh. 
please um, go to your audio settings and increase your input. Is and that while yes, that's much better. Thank you. Okay, hi, I'm Grace Musser. Um, I'm a rising junior at St. John's University in New York, um, in New York City, which is currently the pan, um, epicenter of the pandemic in the United States. Um, I am going into my second year as president for our Catholic Relief Services uh, Ambassadors Club on campus. Um, so we do a lot of work focusing on trying to bring, you know, global issues to the attention of students on campus, because often there are so many other issues on the forefront, um, especially for youth with, you know, all types of struggles with democracy um, all over the world. It's so easy to fall into and be focused on, you know, those individual struggles of your nation, but there's things that are so much bigger, and I think that's really what we try to focus on, too. Um, so, I mean, a lot of what I've done in CRS, too, has really just highlighted the interconnectedness between all these issues that we've been talking about, whether it be hunger and poverty, health, um, sustainability, the environment. Um, it, it's just all connected with, within finance and the economy. Um, it's all tied up in the global economy because that has, the past 70 years of development have created that as the path forward. Um, in development, and I think that's something that we're starting to, in the world development, kind of get away from. And I think the youth um, are very, I mean, youth in general, I think, seem to be stronger in that, um, in that progressive push. But there is also, like, a distrust, I think, going both ways, um, and a skepticism going both ways between youth and people in positions of power. Um, and it's really important to bridge that gap and have those conversations that are going to um, help us move forward together um, because the solidarity is just so important. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there for now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Grace. Um, the topic in particular, building trust between youth and those in power and development, I feel is incredibly prevalent and can be pointed as a sort of contention a source of contention, excuse me, in a lot of different regions and a lot of different development projects. So I'd like to thank you for highlighting that issue. I would like to now move on to Philippe to introduce himself and to address the question as to what do we need to do to increase youth engagement in FFD at the government level and at the United Nations. Thank you, Philippe. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, joining you this morning. Um, and to speak after all these engaging speakers that have spoken already. Um, maybe, maybe I just want to make two um, brief introductory comments. One is um, explaining a little bit what we do at our uh, office, the Financing for Development Office at the UN, where I work. Um, and then secondly, uh, discuss a little bit the current issues um, that are of importance that have been emerging from the meetings. Um, and of course, we have already heard from a few uh, of the preceding speakers that the coronavirus pandemic is, of course, a, a key part of that. Um, so first, let me um, say a little bit what we do in pursuit of the Addis Agenda and in support of the intergovernmental processes that we support at the UN. Um, as, you, as you all know, the you know, youth plays a critical role uh, in the Addis Agenda. Um, I think I believe it's paragraph seven, um, where youth is really... Um, um, fleshed out uh, quite um, importantly as a key aspect of uh, financing for development. Um, and um, so what we do in our work uh, in the intergovernmental process is to really um, try to bring the Addis Agenda to life through different um, meetings, through different work on the ground. Um, and um, one of the key um, aspects of that is, of course, the Financing for Development Forum, which a few of you might be um, familiar with. Um, it also includes other work, for example, the De Development Cooperation Forum um, that discusses um, different trends and how to um, uh, scale up development cooperation. Um, there's also our work uh, on tax, um, which is uh, quite important. Um, and then also, um, more specifically on the ground, the uh, capacity development uh, work. So all of this is in pursuit and in support of the ADIS agenda to advance the seven action areas of the ADIS agenda. 
And um, maybe to now transition into the uh, second part of my comments, which is um, the current topics. Um, so on 23rd April, we had the uh, virtual meeting, of course, all meetings now are virtual, of the Financing for Development Forum. Um, and I think um, some topics that are uh, emerged strongly and that are also quite relevant for youth, of course, is how to um, address uh, the coronavirus pandemic, which, of course, has had um, health impacts, but also, as some other speakers have already mentioned, social impacts, economic impacts. And so uh, we're really working on how to um, improve and scale up financing for development to respond to this challenge. Um, and I think one of the overarching narratives that emerged from this work is that we really have to uh, build back better uh, from, from this crisis. Of course, uh, many countries uh, struggle with uh, fiscal space. You know, the revenues have decreased, the government revenues have decreased. At the same time, the uh, need for spending has increased uh, for social spending. So uh, governments really face uh, uh, um, uh, challenges in overcoming um, these, these funding uh, issues relating to the virus. And so in this context, it is important that we use the resources that we have to really build back stronger, build back better, build back greener, uh, build back in a more sustainable way uh, and invest the resources at our disposal into a better future. I think that is critical for youth, right? We don't want to return to uh, business as usual. Uh, we really want to have a recovery that is greener, better, and is better, uh, better for the future. And I think this is a key uh, entry point uh, really um, for, for youth to engage on this narrative that we need to build back better from this crisis and not simply try to get back to our existing pathway, but really go on a new trajectory where we will have a better future, where we address issues such as climate change, which are really critical uh, for all of us. And so I, I think let me stop here and um, give it back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe, for your, your insight and your input, um, particularly the point of needing to build back using exist existing systems in a way that is stronger and greener than it was before. Um, through all of the, of course, now virtual meetings I have been attending, uh, the point has been reiterated repeatedly that it is so much easier to work through what we have than building something new and through working through existing systems uh, to ensure that youth voices are heard is an incredibly crucial element to this conversation. So I'd like to thank you for that. Um, now I would like to, she's already spoken, but introduce, I invite her to introduce herself, uh, Francesca, and to have her answer the question regarding what do we need to do to increase youth engagement in FFD at a community level and at an organizational level? Thank you, Francesca. Thanks so much, Jacqueline, and thank you to the speakers that have gone before me. I think you've um, set the stage very nicely about what youth participation in financing for development means. I wanted to speak um, from a personal perspective as youth representative and as the co-host of the webinar today, um, and just from kind of what I've observed as well in this area, and I think a key, um, a key thing that both Jacqueline and I found within Financing for Development and many of the conversations is that currently there aren't that many spaces for youth involvement and for youth engagement. And I think um, the purpose of this webinar, one of the key purposes was to get that conversation going and to open up and to discuss different ways where we can find um, ways of increasing youth engagement um, to make it sustainable and to make it effective. And so I'm the current youth representative for the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I'm currently in Melbourne, back home from New York, but I um, have still been engaged as much as I can within financing for development at the United Nations. And um, I know there are some existing establishments, particularly with the UN major group for children and youth, there is a financing for development um, uh, area and sector and then as it's been spoken about the Addis Ababa action agenda does refer to youth and there are a number of different reports and different frameworks that address financing for young people and for children 
One thing that I found when I was addressing, uh, having a look at these different reports is they often refer to young people as recipients of financing for development. And it's often um, not discussed about young people as actors and as decision makers in financing for development. So I just wanted to bring forth a, an idea and a, um, a, I guess, a program that's been initiated about financing for development from a youth perspective as decision makers and as actors. So this was taken from the World Youth Report in 2018 and it focuses on youth and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now, this is just one um, concept and one example they give of a, different, of a project that includes young people. And it's regarding um, participatory budgeting. So essentially what that means is including citizens as decision makers in the allocation of public resources and public funding. And the report gives two different anecdotes. And one is refers to the city of Boston, where in 2014, it started the first participatory budgeting program that focused on youth. So for this program, they invited young volunteers to actually create different proposals uh, for community development projects and actually present these proposals, create the budgets, and these are voted on annually. Now, another example of youth participatory budgeting is in the Phoenix um, Union High School District in Arizona. They invited young students from about four or five different high schools to actually be a part of a group that decided on the allocation of $26,000 worth of funding within the school fund, uh, district. So I guess this is an example of how they have taken, as Philippe mentioned, an existing framework and included um, youth as key engagers. And I think that kind of, it's, it's one way that we can include youth in the conversation. I think um, including them in, in, existing, in existing frameworks like Philippe and Jacqueline both mentioned. I think there's also an opportunity to uh, decide how we can adapt existing frameworks to more suit youth and thinking about the perspective of youth and thinking about um, the way that youth do focus on development and how they advocate. And then also lastly, just uh, creating new programs for young people to be a part of engaging in financing for development. And I'd encourage everybody if they have um, local ideas on how they're increasing young engagement within um, sustainable development and financing for development, please share them in the chat. We'd love to discuss them further and I think start this, create this conversation about different ideas. Um, I'd also like to bring up the idea of education and I know Santrina mentioned this as it's never too young to start the discussion on financing for development. And I think um, from my personal experience, I know there isn't um, a great deal of education around financing for development. And I did hear as well from a colleague in India today who mentioned that um, their perspective was also that there was inadequate education about financing for development and what that means. And I guess for young people, it's deciding, well, how do you, how do you engage and educate young people um, to advocate on, on, on such an issue? And I think for young people, it's not inherent. The value of financing isn't inherent. It's quite far removed from us and the decisions that we make and the issues that we're faced with. So I think trying to identify at a young age and educate young people at a young age the value of financing that it has in development, that it's not this arbitrary number, that it's not a separate issue to things like climate change or gender equality or poverty that we learn about in school, but it is really foundational to all these issues. And by ignoring it or by um, not educating young people on financing for development, we really aren't educating them in a way that they can address the entire picture of these different social and environmental issues. So I think that's a core challenge with financing for development is education. And I think when young people are often in different education streams like school or university, it's so easily accessible. I mean, we can access these young people and, and educate them on financing. So I think using those channels um, can be very beneficial and also informal and um, informal education as well. And how can we include financing education in that area? Area. And so I would love to also increase engagement and talk about that issue. So how do we increase education in financing for development for young people? And I guess um, I'll end there and I'll let Jacqueline continue and see where we're going next in the webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you for highlighting the importance of youth education on the issue. 
and the, the concept of participatory budgeting in particular, as we have seen by several panelist contributions and by the example of the Sierra Leone Psychiatric Teaching Hospital, when youth are educated, when they are given a voice in their communities and the allocation of resources, things are done in a way that is sustainable and beneficial for the future. Um, so I'd like to thank you for that contribution. We will now be moving into a moderated question and answer section, um, engaging all of our fantastic attendants. So those of you in attendance at this webinar, please add your questions to the chat and we will begin um, directing them at panelists. If you have questions for specific panelists, please include their name with your question and we will have them address your concerns and questions. Thank you. I believe I saw a few hands raised earlier. Francesca, are there still a couple hands up? Not at the moment, um, but, oh, there we go. I think I'll hear, um, I'll just double check with. Right. There we, go. we do have a question from Margaret O'Dyer that's just um, been added and she asks financing can be intimidating because of so many complex terms and acronyms and I'm sure we have all been there I have myself as well how can it be put in plain terms understandable to you youth I think this is a very prevalent question Santrina I see your hand raised uh, just, feel free to answer this thank you Francesca I, I'm just ignited to say precisely and maybe you can elaborate more and I want to say that everything begins with a positive mindset these things are so scary and I want to share an experience I had over lunch when uh, one person said I see you're going to talk about finance I'm so afraid so if you don't see me participating just bear with me I'm afraid of finances so I, I was like but we are going to exchange ideas so do not be afraid come just listen to what is going to be discussed Nobody enjoys, anyway, maybe some people enjoy it, but it is something tricky that someone can say, I'm very passionate about money. It's very few, of course. But every big story begins from a positive mindset. So my dear friend, once you have a positive mind that you want to learn and gain some expertise in that, then if you are positive about it, definitely that is the starting point. Thank you, Francesca. Thanks so much, Centrina. I appreciate that. I think it's very relevant. And thank you for um, sharing that story about uh, the interaction you had today. I hope they were able to join. Um, and I hope they are able to, um, it's able to become a less scary topic and, and, and a bit more approachable. Um, okay, I see we have a question from Cecilia O'Dwyer. Could you speak about some of the practical forces for the change that you see happening? So what kind of things, I guess, are driving this change and driving the increase of um, community, oh, sorry, not community, youth engagement in FFD? Yeah, any, yes, Grace, please. So um, I was just gonna say, I mean, with, it, it's, finance can be very difficult, especially when it comes to like NGOs and, and essentially development, because you're talking about, um, economics, which considers a lot of what we do in development, like an externality. Um, so it can be sometimes hard to like make that connection. Um, I think that at St. John's, I mean, we do have a um, program. It's a, it's a course you can take called Globe and it's a microfinancing course. Um, so you essentially, there's different teams and um, you work on, you know, learning about microfinancing and you know, connecting with people in other countries and actually building those relationships and kind of doing it yourself to see it's actually not that I mean it's a little complicated yeah you're gonna have to learn some stuff but it's accessible and I think just like participating um, you know being a conscious consumer so whether that be in how you're consuming media how you're consuming products um, I, I think there are a lot of tools that we do have that aren't necessarily that we don't necessarily know how to use or utilize. And that's, I think, a big problem. Like the tools might be around or there, but, and back to like the education piece, we might not know how to utilize or um, actually access them. 
like okay. to add that youth should not be sold short. Um, while all young people may not be PhDs in finance, they are experts in their own experience. They are experts in their own communities. Uh, they know the issues intimately. Um, and while they may not know financial jargon, they know what needs to be done. So giving youth a seat at the table, including them in the conversation, provides incredibly rich insight into how to ensure that programs are sustainable and how they are able to reach the largest um, population possible. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, today's uh, youth understand and care more about development than ever before. That's what I, I feel. Um, that's why we have youth activists like Greta and many others who are at the forefront to fight for climate and social justice. Um, the young people, uh, especially who represent the majority of the population in most developing countries are today visibly contributing as political actors, innovators, uh, entrepreneurs, and peace builders. I think we need to really um, give chance to the youth to develop their uh, their talents and uh, especially create sp space for them for the educational entrepreneurship and job opportunities for the youth. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, Grace and Jacqueline for your um, fantastic inputs. I would like to address the next question to Philippe if, in case he has any recommendations. Um, and that is, what workable solutions do you recommend based on your experience or information? And I think particularly maybe um, in terms of engaging young people in the current UN processes and the different um, the programs that they have available in financing for development. How can we in include young people in these conversations? Jessica, thanks a lot. I think that's a really a critical uh, question. Um, I, I think, of course, you're, you're aware of the um, different avenues that are at the UN. Uh, where youth are very closely engaged, for example, the, the, the ECOSOC Youth Forum, um, which is really an, an, an excellent um, avenue um, to, to really engage on, on, on some of those issues. Uh, and I uh, completely agree with the, the speakers that have come before me that it's critical uh, that we really get uh, youth voices into the conversation, as I already just said, um, you know, youth features prominently in the ADIS agenda and right on some of the first pages uh, it's mentioned throughout the document. So I think it's really critical that we get the, the youth voice in on, on these issues. And especially, as I just said as well, in relation to the topics that are currently discussed, which are also very, very much forward looking, right? There's really, this is really an excellent entry point for, for youth to get engaged and say, you know, hey, we want uh, climate change to be addressed. We want the, the um, financing, um, um, environment to really uh, address the issue of, of, of climate change. So I think it's very critical that we really look for these entry points um, where youth can really you know, say, you know, we want action on this specific issue. We want to move forward on, on this issue. And I think it's, it's critical that, that that is amplified even more. Santrina, yes, would you like to add to that? Thank you, Philippe. I'm just looking at another question here from one of the attendees that what are we aiming exactly? The youth to be involved passively or actively? And I would strongly say that our aim is to involve the youth actively because there is no way one can learn how to swim without stepping in the water. You have to get into the waters and try out, then you learn how to swim. So even in financing for development, it is important that the youth get involved actively so that they can learn all the techniques. Right now we have our elders, we appreciate them for the commendable services, their example, and also their mentorship. But tomorrow they will not be there. For them they have done their part. They are the giants on whose shoulders the youth step today. But tomorrow, if a youth is not engaged today, they will not know what to do tomorrow. Look at the projects that are managed by mature people today. Youth need to be introduced gradually. Pole pole, we say pole pole in Swahili, meaning slowly, gently, such that when their time comes to manage those particular projects, they already have the expertise of making them grow. 
so that they don't make them perish, but rather make them grow. So we are just aiming that our youth get involved actively in financing for development. Thanks so much, Sanjana, for that uh, for that answer. That was fantastic, and thank you, Philip, for the answer on um, the recommendations on how we move forward engaging young people at the UN, especially. I'd like to direct this next question to Grace. Um, someone's asked if you are able to define microfinancing, please, in simple terms. So um, microfinancing is a form of loan, essentially, that um, it's non-traditional in that it doesn't use like a traditional credit or banking systems, but it's kind of lending more person to person. And there, there are several ways to, um, or systems to do microfinancing, but it is much more sustainable in people are they're not borrowing amounts that they're not going to be able to pay back on, in, on crazy interest rates um, and also there are communal ways of microfinancing where people lend to each other and that is really you know increasing self-sufficiency and not increasing dependency thanks grace that was awesome um a great uh a great definition for yeah i think something that um is 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 crucial to understand when you're thinking about financing and development uh, i'd like to address the next question myself from nicole she's asked how do you get schools to educate all on finances from a young age when finances often are not the top priority and i think when i think about financing for development and i even think about my personal experience of not really understanding the value it's just as we teach um, more and more about things like climate change and about gender equality and just as how we explain to young people how all their different actions and consequences are interconnected. I think including financing as one of those pieces of the ecosystem, as one of those pieces of the circle that um, creates these issues. I mean, many of the issues that we see related to climate change right now, um, when we think about how financing can maybe mitigate or change these issues. It's a very core. Uh, it's a very core model, and we think about why climate change is an issue now, and what led climate change to be um, in the state that it is today. How does financing impact on that? So I think connecting financing um, as a core mode and as a core facet of many of the issues that we focus on today within the global the global community, I think, is core to encouraging young people and getting them excited about financing, which I think is the key. Um, how do we get young people excited about financing and how do we let them feel as though they have a voice and they are able to act on financing for development in a sustainable way, I think is very important as well, because it can feel quite unreachable for a young person um, to make a difference within the financing for development area. Okay, off to the next question um, from Ansi Thomas. How do we really envisage engaging the youth today as a vast number of them have lost their livelihood opportunities? So I guess thinking about how, how do we continue to um, reach out to young people to make spaces for them to engage? Can anyone speak on their own experience? I can speak to a, a bit of an experience that I had. Oh. In high school, I took a class on project-based learning, and this was years ago. It's, it's been a while since I've been in high school. Um, but this course was a project-based learning course. And initially, we did projects where we paired with companies, solving problems for companies. But then it slowly became solving projects for and with communities. We developed um, chicken coops that were built in a sustainable way that prevented foxes from accessing the chickens for uh, communities in rural Haiti. And we did so with input from the communities and we were taught how to do that, how to engage in that conversation in high school. However, this is a course I took outside of the normal curriculum. This wasn't a core course. This wasn't even a course taught during the day. It was something that I had to do after school. Project-based learning is becoming a, a very prevalent component in education, particularly in the United States and in the West. And ensuring that an element of project-based learning is financing for development could be a very effective early way to ensure that youth know how to engage in these conversations, participate in them, and do them responsibly and sustainably. 
And I'll just add to, I think um, at the base of it is solidarity. I think it's a very simple concept, but you know, ensuring that we really are emphasizing and whether it be through education, through politics, whatever um, avenues, religion, that we're emphasizing solidarity and the common good because that is so, that expands to all other issues, just like economics, like is at the root of all these other things. So is solidarity. And if we are more focused on, you know, um, furthering a common good, that's, that's bigger than just doing something for ourselves. And that can motivate more, I think, and, you know, push people a little harder to work a little harder if they can see the potential of, you know, what a common good, what solidarity can truly um, bring. But I also think media is really important. So I think it's a, it's a little bit um, paradoxical, I guess, in the way media um, helps these um, resistance movements or um, activist movements in that, like, it's so important for engagement and for people to understand, like, and spread words of these movements. But at the same time, I think we are forced through media and social media in particular to like squeeze our messages down and condense them um, into something much smaller than they are. So um, when people, I guess, are consuming these messages, um, they're not really getting the full picture. And I think that's, that hurts us. And I think that hurts everyone. Um, and that's why I think like you look at famine and it, it gets a lot more attention than you know the larger problem of an endemic hunger because you can put photos of starving children on the internet and get more money than if you're talking about you know a child who doesn't necessarily look like they're starving. So I think there's definitely like a catch-22 with the media piece, but I think it is very important to engage. Thank you, Grace. Absolutely. I think that um, a media is a very important consideration in any conversation when we're talking about sustainable development um, that includes both the decision making level and at the local level as well. All right. Um, Cecilia O'Dwyer has asked, do you think that universities need to examine the kind of economics they teach? I guess, Philip, do, would you have any, um, would you have any perspective on the relationship between, I guess, education, formal education at a university level and how that would translate to financing for development? Yes, hi, sorry. Um, no, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question, really. And I think the, the, one of the key issues is that, um, you know, I think financing for development, we need to see it as something that is integral to all other aspects of sustainable development. It's really a cross-cutting issue. Any, and that's why it's also, that's why we refer to it as the means of implementation. These are the means to implement our 2030 agenda. And so it really, financing plays into all the SDGs. All SDGs will only be achieved if we really mobilize our resources to achieve them. And that is what financing for development uh, is really about. So any expertise on any of the uh, fields and any of the SDGs can really be translated into advocating for financing um, to mobilize the resources that we need to implement the specific um, SDGs. So I think any learning experience on any aspects of sustainable development can really also translate into um, a discussion about financing for development because these are the means to achieve our goals, which are the sustainable development goals. Fantastic, thank you, Philippe. Um, I guess I would like to ask um, a question perhaps to all the panelists, and that is in terms of next steps, where can you see the best opening for young people to engage with financing for development? So I guess, where do you see the largest opportunity for young people to engage. And we'd like to start with, who would like to begin? Yeah, I can start. Um, yeah, Cynthia, please. Thank yeah. you. I, I think it, you know, it, it, it has to begin with the uh, local level. They need to see what's happening in their community. 
how the government is involved in the community development of the community. So from um, local to national and national to international level uh, involvement in decision making, see that the youth get into the decision making table. If you are uh, not at the table, you will be on the menu. So it is very important that youth participate at, at a local, national and international level advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Centrina, please. Uh, thank you, Francesca. Uh, if I can talk about the youth from the third world nations, whereby most of the projects survive on foreign aid, I think it is important that these young people are involved in every stage from planning to budgeting, monitoring, accounting, and all sorts of things so that they learn that even with foreign aid, they should envision a society that is growing towards sustainability in case the foreign aid is no longer available. Have they developed means of sustaining themselves? So when they are involved in the process of planning and budgeting, accounting, the whole process, then they will be able to learn how to work towards self-sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Santrina. Grace, did you have anything to add on um, how the young people can best, I guess, um, engage at first with financing for development? I mean, especially right now um, in this pandemic, I think, again, I'm just going to go back to media. I think that's one of the most important things, and it's one of the biggest ways we have right now. I mean, look at what this webinar, you know, it's a form of media. It's a form of us sharing, you know, showing solidarity and, and learning from each other. And I think that's really important is to just keep trying to learn from each other and, you know, share ideas. Um, participation like Cynthia said I think that's something that I've always um, it seems like such a simple idea but participation is so important just showing up to different meetings different you know webinars just showing up different places and being willing to learn because that's where a lot of magic happens and you'll get ideas that you wouldn't necessarily connect like you know um, if you go to an economics seminar you might connect it to a lot of social justice ideas um, so I think it's just important to participate and keep just, yeah, keep your eyes and your ears and your mind open. Thanks, Grace. Philip, did you have any, um, anything to add on that? I mean, I can only agree what was uh, said so far on this, on this question. Um, and um, may, maybe just to, to, to reiterate, so if, if you, feel strongly, for example, about climate change, you automatically are an advocate in FFD because you want things to change. You want financial flows to be aligned with the Paris agenda, to be aligned with the 2030 agenda. If you feel strongly about uh, combating inequality, for example, you are immediately also um, automatically uh, an advocate for financing for development because you want to see change in how resources are distributed and how resources are used to tackle inequality. So I think it's really critical that we think about, you know, what do we feel strongly about? What, what, what do we want to advocate for? Where are the issues that we want to make a difference in? And I can guarantee that by really looking at these issues, you will also be an advocate for financing for development because that's really where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. And that is where you can make a difference because in order to see change, we need to see how FFD is changing and how finances are used in a way uh, and the means to implement our goals are used in a way that is um, aligned with how we want the, the future to look like. Absolutely, thank you, Philippe. Jacqueline, did you have um, a perspective that you'd like to include? Absolutely, I would like to echo what um, Sister Centrina said, uh, particularly in that at every level of engagement, youth voices are crucial. And to reiterate again, um, the, the marked effectiveness of including youth in conversations when it comes to sustainable development in their own communities and financing for development. As I've said before, youth are experts in their, in their own experience. And as several panelists have stated, youth are 
more passionate now than ever about a wide variety of issues. And as it has been said, all of these issues have the root of financing for development. The way to engage meaningfully with these issues from climate change to food security is through sustainable development. And so educating young people, providing initiatives that include them in project development is absolutely crucial in ensuring that this development is sustainable, uh, particularly in this time of global uncertainty. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, I think you've all spoken very well on um, the best ways that we can begin to include young people in this conversation and continuing to open doors for young people to um, feel as though and really experience that they have a voice and an active contribution in financing for development that is very, um, what is valued and that is sustainable. So thank you everybody for engaging in this Q&A. Um, I have posted a couple of messages about what you can do next and I'll continue to post them um, before the end of the webinar and also a link to the Addis Ababa Action Agenda as well, which can be a great document, um, especially if you're not as familiar with financing for development at the UN level. So I'll pass it on to Jacqueline to close up. Thank you very much, Francesca. And I'd like to say thank you to all of our wonderful panelists today. You offered such fantastic perspectives from such a wide variety of backgrounds and industries. So I'd like to thank you for that. Um, I would also like to mention that I believe I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning of the panel. I was so excited about introducing the topic and our panelists that I forgot to int introduce myself. Um, so my name is Jacqueline Wicke and I'm with the Congregations of St. Joseph. I would like to thank you all for coming and contributing to this discussion. Um, if any of our panelists, panelists, excuse me, have any final thoughts, they can share now and then we will wrap up for the day. Thank you again and thank you to the NGO Committee on Financing for Development as well. I'd just like to thank you all for, you know, having me and participating and, you know, keeping on to do this wonderful work. So thank you all. Uh, I see uh, just a, a question from one of the attendees that any thoughts on how technology can be creatively used to promote activities related to financing for development? Youth are pretty good at technology. I agree, youth are very, very good at technology and it is just creativity that can make someone use it for financing for development. For example, people especially are interested in social media. So what you post can attract people to you or make them run away from you. And also the animations, the filmmakers, the creative posters, the colorful adverts that someone can put on social media, that can be a way of financing for development. So if someone thinks creatively, media is very, very rich. You can make technology be your beginning, <laughs> starting point of financing for development. Thank you. All right, if there are no further comments, I would like to thank you all again. Thank you for your participation, your insights, your questions. This is an incredibly crucial topic, uh, particularly given global circumstances. And I would like to thank you all for taking time out of your day to address it and to share your insight and perspective with us. Have a good day and be well. Thank you all.